In the first video in this series, we saw that the more ApoB particles there are in the lumen, the more ApoB particles enter the artery, the more ApoB particles get stuck in the artery, and the higher the risk of atherosclerosis. In this video, we'll talk about how to incorporate ApoB into clinical care, and we'll look at some examples. But first, when it comes to ApoB, how high is too high? We look at three ranges. An ApoB above 145 mg per deciliter indicates an extreme risk of cardiovascular disease. An ApoB between 120 and 145 mg per deciliter indicates a very high intermediate term and long term risk. And finally, a patient whose ApoB is between 105 and 120 mg per deciliter is considered at high long term risk and might be at higher intermediate term risk. If your patient falls into either of the first two categories, you may be looking at a case of familial hypercholesterolemia or familial combined hyperlipidemia. What should you do? Recommend lifestyle and diet improvements. Treat the patient pharmacologically as long as there is no contraindication such as pregnancy. And do cascade screening of family members to see if they're affected as well. If your patient's ApoB level falls in the lower range, you should repeat and confirm these findings at the next clinic visit and recommend lifestyle measures such as healthy diet, exercise, stopping smoking, etc. Now let's look at a couple of clinical examples to see how ApoB helps clarify whether a patient is at high cardiovascular risk. First, say you have two patients who have the same standard lipid panel. Should you conclude they present the same cardiovascular risk? Well, let's see. Both patients are at the 72nd percentile for LDLC and at the 78th percentile for non-HDLC. But if you measure ApoB, you see that one patient is only at the 45th percentile for ApoB, which is just under the average, while the other patient is much higher, at the 88th percentile, putting them at much higher cardiovascular risk due to the higher number of ApoB lipoproteins. Now let's take another example where non-HDLC is at the 65th percentile and LDLC is at the 50th percentile. On that basis alone, you might conclude that your patient does not present a high risk of cardiovascular disease. But when you measure ApoB, you find that it's at the 75th percentile. Hmm. So which number do you trust? The Framingham Heart Study examined survival rates for patients with different non-HDL and ApoB combinations. It revealed that people with a higher ApoB have lower survival rates than those with lower ApoB levels even though their non-HDLC or their LDLC was the same. And so your patient is, in fact, at a higher risk, but you would not have known this if you hadn't measured their ApoB levels. Finally, let's look at a 50-year-old woman who comes to your clinic. Her non-HDLC is at the 75th percentile, and her LDLC is at the 80th percentile. But once you measure her ApoB, you find that she's only at the 51st percentile, the same Framingham Heart Study found that patients with lower ApoB levels have better survival rates, regardless of whether non-HDLC or LDLC levels are high or low. And so, you conclude that your patient is not at high risk of cardiovascular disease after all. Now, how do we treat hyperapoB? The same way we treat LDLC, because it turns out that our treatments lower LDLC by increasing the rate at which ApoB particles are removed from plasma. There are three treatments that lower cholesterol and ApoB by reducing the number of ApoB particles within the lumen, which reduces cardiovascular risk. Statins, ezetimibe, and PCSK9 inhibitors. Given these three forms of treatment, how do you judge the effectiveness of the course you've chosen? You measure ApoB to assess your patient's response to therapy. The reason for this is that ApoB can be measured more accurately than LDLC or non-HDLC, particularly at low levels and because randomized clinical trials have shown that ApoB is a more accurate measure of residual cardiovascular risk than LDLC or non-HDLC. This has been shown for statin treatment, for statin plus ezetimibe treatment, and for combined statin plus PCSK9 inhibitor treatment. Now let's talk about treatment intensification thresholds. How low should your patient's ApoB level be for you to consider that your treatment has been effective? The 2021 Canadian Cardiovascular Society Lipid Guidelines provide some insight. Based on the IMPROVE-IT trial, a patient who's had a recent acute coronary syndrome is already on maximally tolerated doses of statins and has an ApoB greater than equal to 70 mg per deciliter or an LDL greater than equal to 69.5 mg per deciliter 
or a non-HDLC greater than or equal to 92.6 mg per deciliter, would benefit from intensified lipid-lowering therapy through the addition of azetamibe in combination with a statin. Or, if the same patient is already on a statin and azetamibe, then intensifying therapy with a PCSK9 inhibitor should be considered. The Fourier and Odyssey trials, which demonstrated increased benefit with statin PCSK9 therapy, have added powerfully to this recommendation. If your patient has no atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, but does have familial hypercholesterolemia, is already on a maximally tolerated dose of statins, with or without azetamide, and their APOB is greater than or equal to 80 mg per deciliter, then PCSK9 inhibitors should be used. If your patient has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and also has familial hypercholesterolemia and is already on a maximally tolerated dose of statins with or without azetamide therapy and their APOB is greater than or equal to 70 mg per deciliter or LDLC greater than or equal to 69.5 mg per deciliter or their non-HDLC is greater than or equal to 92.6 mg per deciliter, then a PCSK9 inhibitor should be added. Other guideline bodies may suggest different treatment intensification thresholds, and we encourage clinicians to learn about what is being recommended in their area. The general principle is that lower is better. So should we entirely disregard conventional panels? The answer is no. And the reason is that an LDLC level greater than 190 mg per deciliter is further indication of a familial component, and you should consider FH. Triglyceride levels greater than 1,000 mg per deciliter point to a high risk of pancreatitis, and an LPA greater than 50 mg per deciliter may indicate a case better managed by lipid specialists. And we'll discuss this further in the next video. The conventional lipid panel has its place, but ApoB is essential for clarifying whether a patient is at high cardiovascular risk and helping you determine whether the treatments you are providing are effective. Stay tuned for more information on how to incorporate LP little a into clinical care.